Welcome back to another video this is a part 2 of. What if Issei fell in love with Sona after Rias broke his heart? I don't really want to drag out the intro so let's get started. Chapter 5. Sona's Chance. A high school DXD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 5 inches the depth of a bad memory. Scene, Sona's dorm room. Finally getting out of the bathroom, Issei found himself wearing the pink nightgown with a very large blush plaster to his face. Both Sona and Tsubaki were at their bunk-style beds as they looked to be in conversation, this stopped once Issei was visible. Sona, who was laying on the top bed, leaned over while looking at Issei. She was doing the best she could not to say something out loud as this scene was beyond cute to her. Issei looked very vulnerable in her opinion and it was turning her on a bit, though she would refuse her instincts as to maintain the nobility of the Seatree house, which first took priority. So, the devil heiress allowed herself the smallest of grins but only for a moment. Tsubaki, laying on the bottom and level bed, was also turned toward Issei. Her stoic features remained the same however. Without changing her demeanor, Tsubaki pointed up with her index finger, toward Sona's bed, for a moment, afterwards she then pointed toward an empty part of her own bed. At that, Sona's face began to uncontrollably blush. Meanwhile, Issei was standing where he was, next to the bathroom entrance, he looked absolutely terrified. Is this what Seraphal meant by him being in good hands? Issei nervously looked around this sparse dorm room. Then, to his relief, he spotted a small love seat which was next to a small living room space. Issei then pointed toward the piece of furniture. You know, I can't help but wonder if the two of you are messing with me, but, if it's all the same, I could just crash right there and be totally fine. In fact, I really shouldn't be here in the first place. Issei then walked toward the love seat while finding it awkward to move in his female clothing. If Rias found out, well, I guess, when she finds out, it's going to be an absolute shitstorm. I mean, your sister already, oh man, this sucks. Both Sona and Tsubaki sat up from their positions and simply listened. After sitting down onto the couch, Issei throws both of his hands over his head in a panic. This really sucks, as embarrassing as this whole thing is, I just feel humiliated. Wait a minute, Issei glanced over at both Sona and then Tsubaki. Lifting an eyebrow, Issei asked what was now on his mind. You guys both know about what happened, earlier in the orc, don't you? You heard what I said, what Rias said, both girls nodded without hesitation. Issei stopped looking toward the two and chose a spot on the ceiling to stare at. This was so humiliating for him. Not only did he confess to someone far out of his league, only to be rejected, no, he also did this while making a fool out of himself in front of his peerage, his friends. Then a leader of the underworld shows up and takes pity on him. She then pawns him off onto her sister who was yet another person, far out of his league. Only to disrupt her daily life. Now here he was, about to break down again in front of the student council president, while wearing a pink nightgown. It couldn't possibly get any worse, Issei thought. Sona slowly got down from her bed and proceeded toward Issei. Tsubaki raises an eyebrow. Issei, who was still looking up at the ceiling, was very deep in thought with visions of doom. As closer proximity, Sona was able to see the depressed teen's warm and brown eyes begin to water up. He also looked to be slightly shaking. Sona looked back at a now concerned looking Tsubaki. Tsubaki then cleared her throat while laying back completely down in her bed. Hyodo, it's fine, you can always stay here whenever you like. I am sure the president is in full agreement. As Issei turned to look toward the beds, he was surprised to see Sona's eyes looking directly back at him. She wasn't wearing her glasses which made her look different yet equally beautiful in Issei's opinion. At first Issei was dumbstruck but the feeling of a single tear, sliding down his cheek instantly made him aware of his situation. Reaching with his hand to wipe his face, his arm was caught by Sona's warm and soft hand. Shocked, Issei didn't move as Sona slowly moved closer. The expression on her face was very serious as her violet eyes seemed to pierce into the male teen's soul. Sona then spoke very softly without moving her gaze from Issei's wide and shocked eyes. What she said to you? After everything you sacrificed, I can't forgive that, Hyodo. You deserve better and I can't believe I am saying this but, Issei. Tsubaki now rolls over on her side facing the opposite of where Issei and Sona were. 
Pulling the sheets over her head, the vice president of the student council begins to blush and smile like a little girl the night before her birthday party. Sona then stretched her neck slightly so that her lips were inches from Issei's left ear. Closing her eyes, she speaks very quietly. I want you to know that you can depend on me from now on. If you don't mind somebody like me, that is. Issei pulled back from Sona while looking back at her with what could only be described as fear along with confusion. Wait, what, are you saying? Sona then cleared her throat and proceeded to stare at an area of the ceiling this time. I mean, if you need friends, you know, erm, people you can count on, you know, for support. Yeah, that's it, don't get the wrong idea, Hyodo. Sona now began to blush heavily while refusing to look toward Issei. Tsubaki now facepalmed underneath the covers of her bed. Issei was once again, dumbstruck, however before he could process anything, Issei's hand, which was still being held by Sona, was now being pulled. Standing from his position, a silent Sona walked the confused team toward the bunk beds. Realizing what was happening, Issei protested. Wait, President, I thought we agreed that I can sleep over there. Without looking behind her as she continued to pull Issei along, Sona replied in a strict tone. You will sleep where I can keep an eye on you. After all, we don't know what kinds of perverted things you will try doing if left to your own devices. Tsubaki was now blushing and smiling again. Oh, President, you go, girl. Fight those Sunere instincts of yours. Being prodded like a farm animal, Sona was literally pushing Issei up the three-step ladder toward the top bunk as the team continued to protest in failure. Move it, Hyodo. Don't argue with me or else. Scene Underworld, Sirzex Sama. In a large and Victorian-style mansion, we see a tall and red-haired man who looks very similar to another red-headed devil we are familiar with. Instantly, the man clad in heavy shoulder armor and cape was tackled into a tight and powerful hug by none other than Seraphal. She was still wearing her magical girl attire while smiling brightly. Meanwhile, a beautiful and silver-headed woman with gray eyes was standing next to Sirzex, she was wearing what looked to be a maid cosplay costume. It was very tight and hugged her very generous figure. She was watching the interaction between Seraphal and Sirzex while showing little emotion. Watching Sirzex struggling while smiling nervously, Grafia chose to speak up as she closed her eyes in a graceful manner. Ah, good evening, Seraphal Sama. Please, what brings you to the Grimori Manor at this hour? Seraphal looked at Grafia all of the sudden. Pushing Sirzex away from her, Seraphal proceeded to tackle the maid into one of her signature bone crushing hugs. Grafia Chan, I've missed you so much. Seraphal then made it a point to lean her head into Grafia's cleavage. Oh, how soft you always are, Sirzex is a lucky man. Grafia now had a flustered and embarrassed look on her pale face. Small blush marks were forming on each of her cheeks as she looked to be struggling. Oh, dear, Seraphal Sama, this is not appropriate. Sirzex was now watching the scene play out as he rubbed the back of his sore neck. He had a warm yet exhausted smile to his face. Seraphal, good evening, like what my wife asked, what brings you here this evening? Seraphal turned her face toward Sirzex, still while hugging a struggling Grafia, her smile then turned into a frown. Ria Tan has been mean to my Sona's Isei-kun. Sirzek's smile also turns into a frown as he sits down in his large chair. What do you mean, Seraphal? Scene, Sona's dorm room. Sleeping back against back, we can see both Sona and Issei, taking up the entire space of the twin bed. They both seem to be deep into unconsciousness as we can hear slight snoring coming from the bottom bunk, from Tsubaki. We then pan back toward Issei and start to focus on him directly. Slightly, Issei begins to stir a bit, not enough to roll around but enough to be noticeable. Issei's mouth then opens and a very quiet word escapes his sleeping lips. Raw rain air. Sona slowly opens her eyes as Issei continues to repeat this word, in between non-comprehensive mumbling. Reaching for her glasses, Sona then proceeds to roll over. She is looking over Issei's shoulder as he continues to stir. Deciding that waking him might be the best idea, the sea tree devil remembered Issei's sacred gear and more so, the drake. Sona carefully pulled back the sheets and slowly pulled Issei's right arm from his side. Bringing said hand close to her head, Sona speaks in a soft voice. Red Dragon Emperor, are you there? 
Issei's arm begins to glow in a mix of crimson and emerald. In Dedrag's quiet voice, he replies, Sona Citri, what can I do for you? Sona looks back at Issei's sleeping face, which was now contorted into a stressed and terrified expression. Thank you for speaking with me. I have to ask, is Hyodo, Erm, is Issei alright? And who is this, Rainer? He keeps repeating to himself. At first, Issei's arm didn't respond. After a minute went by, Sona started to lose patience. Dedrag, are you there? Did you hear me? Then instantly, the arm began to glow once again. To answer your first question, I really don't know to be honest. But I can tell you that it has to do with your second question. Who is Rainer you ask? She is the fallen angel that ruthlessly toyed and eventually killed my host. So, now that you mention it, no, Issei is not alright and he hasn't been since that ordeal. Though I find it odd as you are the first to have asked. Sona's jaw dropped as she continued to look at the violently sleeping team. She then straightened her glasses and asked another question. You said this fallen scum toyed with him. How so? Issei's arm glowed and flickered a few times before a response was made. She pretended to be interested in him and proceeded to get him to go on a romantic date with her. She played my partner like a fine-tuned instrument. Then, if that wasn't bad enough, she asked him to die for her before plunging multiple light spears into his body, only to leave him to bleed to death as she mocked him before making her exit. Although Sona retained her stoic features, tears started to free fall from the violet eyes of the sea tree heiress. And what happened to, to that, that bitch? The drag instantly replied, Rias ended up taking Rainer's life as Issei was unable to, in the end that is. Sona, who was now uncontrollably crying as she continued to watch Issei struggle in his sleep, did. The best she could to reply without completely breaking down. And you just told me that I am the only one that has asked about this. How is that possible? Look at him. Issei's arm then went silent for the rest of the evening. Sona was at a loss for words. Unknown to Sona, Tsubaki was laying under her covers with her eyes wide open. She also looked to be crying as well. Chapter 6, Sona's Chance, a high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazzle. Chapter 6, Strange Bedfellows. Scene, Sona's dorm room. Sona didn't seem to use blackout curtains in her dorm room as sunlight beaded into the room. This was enough to stir a once snoring Tsubaki as she instantly stretched in bed. This caused her feet to smack onto the frame which jared the top bunk. Issei, woke up to the feeling of warmth and something soft against his face that seemed to jiggle a bit with the teetering bed. As his eyes opened, Issei could only see dark, that was until he moved his eyes upward. There he saw the sleeping face of Sona Sitri, the student council president. She held Issei in a very tight embrace with both arms around the boy's neck and shoulders. Meanwhile, under the sheets, Issei could feel one of Sona's legs, straddling around his midsection. Also, it didn't help matters that the teen had his face buried in between Sona's moderate breasts as her nightgown was half-wardly slipped off. This allowed one of her nipples to be exposed to Issei's astonishment. Issei then looked back up at Sona's face as she seemed to stir a bit. Thinking very quickly, the teen figured he should do at least one thing, to make this situation a bit less tense. Deciding that it was now or never, Issei carefully moved one of his hands upward and softly reached for Sona's nightgown near the shoulder line. Without waking Sona, Issei managed to successfully cover the exposed section of Sona's breast while lowering his head and under Sona's arms. Finally, Issei managed to squirm his way out from Sona's arms, however, removing her leg was going to be a chore. As the devil heiress lay directly in front of him, Issei was hoping that he could get past this last obstacle which was Sona halfway straddling him. However, time ran out for Issei as Sona's eyes opened. Sona had a blank look as she blinked a few times. Afterwards, she proceeded to wipe her eyes with both of her hands while yawning. As she was stretching her arms, Sona, still half asleep, spoke up in a stretchy kind of voice. Oh good morning Issei-kun. Issei tilted his head a moment, then he looked down at the sheets, waited a moment, then slowly looked back up at Sona. At that point, Sona's facial features warped into something that of panic. As her eyes slowly widened, the devil's jaw began to drop slowly. Issei decided he should back away as quickly as possible. With that, the panicked teen pushed from his side of the bed, 
which released him from Sona's leg only for him to fall off of the top bunk entirely. Crash. Issei landed directly on his ass. Yeek. Ah. Tsubaki immediately rose from her bottom bunk and looked toward the floor to her right, only to see a whimpering Issei Hyodo. As the queen of the sea tree peerage put on her glasses she then yawned again. Hyodo, were you doing something indecent? Or maybe, president, was it you perhaps? Popping her head over the top bunk and looking down at Tsubaki, Sona's cheeks were puffed out as she looked embarrassed as all hell. Why would you ask me such a foul question? Of course I am innocent in all of this. Tsubaki and Sona now turned their attention to the floored Issei. Seeing this, the boy rubs the back of his head nervously. I seem to have fallen from the bunk bed. That's all that happened. Right, President. Sona nods over enthusiastically while grinning. Victoriously. That is absolutely the case. You see, there, nothing for you to be concerned about, Tsubaki. Issei was just being a baka as usual. Issei then thought to himself. Did she just call me by my first name? Shaking the thought off for now, Issei stood up while realizing what he was wearing. Instantly, Issei covered himself with his hands in a sudden panic. This caused both Sona and Tsubaki to laugh which caused Issei to join in realizing how silly he must look. Scene, Hyodo Residence. Rias woke up to the sound of Issei's anime girl-themed alarm clock. It was screaming obscenities like, wake up you little shit or you're gonna get it. Fine then, you asked for it. Chainsaw sounds, still with her eyes held shut, Rias immediately began to kiss the pillow she was hugging very tightly. Mumbling, Rias spoke to the pillow. Oh Issei, good morning my adorable pawn. Yawn. Rias then opens her eyes while blinking a few times. Then reality struck like a bolt of lightning. Issei wasn't here, he never came home. Why? Oh, that's right, Seraphal took him. Instantly, Rias rose from the bed while staring at the nightstand picture frame. It has a photo of both Rias and Issei, posing together back at the training camp, on that mountain. She stared at it with a blank look to her face. Issei. I'm sorry, I'll make this right today, you'll see. Scene, Sona's dorm room. We see Sona and Issei, both sitting at the small table in the kitchen nook of the small apartment. Meanwhile, in the kitchen itself was Subaki, she looked to be getting a tray ready with an assortment of eggs, toast and coffee. Issei, along with the other two, were all wearing their coup uniforms. Noticing a different odor to his clothing, Issei enjoyed the scent of lavender coming from it. For some reason, this brought a bit of peace to the already nervous team. As Sona looked to be reading a newspaper silently, Issei took his time to study his surroundings a bit more thoroughly. This was a small room, large enough for maybe two students. It had an attached kitchen, dining area along with a small family, living room. Only feet from the kitchen was a small bedroom with only room enough for the bunk beds and two desks along with a tiny walk-in closet. To Issei's surprise, the girls managed to make this small space feel rather cozy in his opinion. Artwork, that seemed to be themed around beaches, rivers and large lakes was adorned throughout the place. Though the furniture seemed rather sparse, the smell of breakfast cooking increased the coziness factor by 11. Sona then peeked through her large newspaper only to see that Issei was smiling while looking around her home in a curious manner. Smirking to herself, Sona pulled the newspaper back up and continued to read her article. Tsubaki came to the table with a tray in hand. Handing everyone's portions out on separate plates, Tsubaki looked a bit nervous now. As she finished pouring everyone's coffee, she then looked at Issei. I know it's nothing fancy, but I hope you like it, Hyodo. Looking at his plate, Issei then smiled more brightly. This smells amazing, I can't wait to dig in. Thank you for the food. Sona and Tsubaki both waited until Issei took his first bite of the eggs over toast. As the team did just that, his eyes instantly widened. Issei took a small sip of his coffee and then looked back at Tsubaki with stars in his eyes. Vice President, this is amazing. It's like Akino's cooking but, Issei's smile then vanished. Blankly looking at his breakfast now, Issei spoke out absentmindedly as if he was thinking out loud. Akino, I wonder if I made her upset too, by saying what I said. Sona cleared her throat, Issei. Coming out of his thoughts, the team looked back up and now at Sona. Oh, I'm sorry, I, was miles away, shaking her head slowly from right to left, Sona spoke up, matter-of-factly. 
Don't worry about how they feel. You are not in the wrong here. Besides, you remember what I told you last night, right? So, stop worrying about nonsense like that right this instant. Do you understand me? Feeling incredibly shocked by Sona's words, Issei wasn't sure if he was hallucinating or not. But was Sona Sitri, the Ice Princess of Kuo Academy, in a way, protecting him? Before Issei could process what was happening, Tsubaki then pointed toward Issei's plate as she maintained her worried look. Well, Hyodo, are you just saying that you like it, or do you mean it? Tsubaki now tilted her head, waiting for a reply. This brought Issei out of his stupor as he noticed how cute his senpai was acting just now. Nodding enthusiastically, Issei spoke up while trying not to choke on his words. Tsubaki, this is the best breakfast I think I have ever had. You have my word, it's absolutely delicious. Issei then scarfed the rest of his food in a beast-like manner. If good if. Tsubaki smiled warmly at this gesture. Sona rolled her eyes while pushing Issei's coffee closer to him. Not with your mouth full, Hyodo. Seen Kuo Academy, early in the morning, about an hour and a half before school actually started. We see the entirety of Sona's peerage walking through the front gates of the academy. Sona was leading the group as Issei was walking next to a normally stoic Tsubaki. Taking a quick glance, Issei noticed how tall Sona's queen was. He then compared hers to his own height, this made him feel a bit emasculated but then again, tall chicks were also really hot, so, it was a catch-22. Shaking off his thoughts, he then looked around at the other peerage members. Unlike Tsubaki, the others would return his stares with a nervous smile on their faces. Sona then stopped walking and proceeded to look at the screen on her ice-blue colored phone. She then looked behind her quickly, making sure nobody was eavesdropping. Then looking back at her phone, she began to text some kind of response. Sona's pa, looking at her message, it was from her sister as the message was labeled, to my adorable So-chan. The message read, well, I have great news, sister. I told Sirzex about Ria Tan being really mean to our little Isei-kun. He was not happy nor was Grafia chan But I found out something very important. Sona, Issei is arranged to marry Rias Grimori. Now, I don't know the full circumstances, but it is important to know this for our future plans, hee <laughs> hee. Sona facepalm. What's this about, our plan? Wait, Issei is in an arranged marriage with, with, Rias. Sona then pushed her thoughts back a few feet as she continued to read the long text. But it's really important too, that you say nothing about this. I had to promise Sirzex kun that I wouldn't repeat anything, so you keep hush. Anyway. Keep a close eye on him for both our sakes, okay? Last thing you should probably know. I am not sure if Sirzex has confronted Ria Tan or not, but be ready just in case, I don't know how your best friend will react as we both know she can have quite the temper. Boo hoo, poor Ria Tan. With that, Sona, not as your sister, but as your Mao, I order you to keep both eyes on Issei Kun. I will check back in with you, shortly. Until then, good luck, sister. Sona places the phone back into her pocket while beginning to walk again. She looks behind her quickly, getting a quick glimpse at the boy she is falling so very hard for. He looked back at her and smiled warmly. Seeing this reaction from Issei, it quickly made Sona turn her head back and face forward. Knowing nobody could see her face from this angle, Sona smiled which was followed up by an intense blush. Issei, Yubaka, seen Hyodo residence. Gathered in the large dining room, we can see Akino, Asia and Kaneko, all doing individual tasks which involve the preparation of morning breakfast. Meanwhile, Rias along with Mr. and Ms. Hyodo, were all sitting at the table while drinking their morning beverages. Mr. Hyodo was reading the newspaper as Ms. Hyodo was looking deeply into a sad-looking Rias's face. Deciding to speak up, Ms. Hyodo decides to ask the question that's been on her mind for most of yesterday and today. Rias, honey, are you feeling all right? You look a bit pale, are you possibly coming down with something? Akino then scoffs as she flips a pancake with her spatula. Rias turns her head toward her queen while scowling. Akino returns an equally insulting scowl of her own. Kaneko keeps to herself and continues to stir her large bowl of eggs. Asia also says nothing and continues on washing a few dishes. Mr. and Ms. Hyodo both notice the strange interaction between the disgruntled friends. 
Placing his newspaper down, Mr. Hyoto then takes a deep breath. All right, what did Issei do this time? Ms. Hyoto was in full agreement with her husband as she nods with a frown. Oh dear, what has our pervert of a son done this time? Hearing Issei's parents calling him a pervert and blaming him for what was happening at this point in time, it was bullshit, in Akino's opinion. She began to tighten her grip on the spatula while her teeth began to grind. Her blood was quite literally boiling. Spoiled rotten Rias showed her true colors yesterday. Even after her precious Kahai did everything in his power, just to save his king, Rias just dismissed him. The pain, the struggling, even the circumstances with him being reborn as a devil, how could Rias be so careless? Akino then blurted out, in quite a harsh tone. Issei didn't do a damn thing. Leave him out of this. Instantly, the Grimori queen put her own hand over her lips. Oh, era era, I am sorry for that outburst. Akino then leaves the room as she throws the hot pan into the dishwasher which creates a large cloud of steam. Nobody was able to see her face as she had both hands covering it. Asia and Kaneko both stare at each other while not knowing what to do at this point. Rias then sinks her head into her hands which were placed on the table. Mr. and Ms. Hyodo both just sit where they are, silent and with their jaws agape. Chapter 7 Sona's Chance, a high school DXD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 7, A Day with the Student Council. Scene, Student Council Office, Kuo Academy. Issei was currently sitting on one of the couches within the large room that was kept at low lighting. Heavy and dark blue curtains were drawn over the windows as candles and Edwardian-era lamps filled the office. Aside from the obvious devil vibes, which Issei was used to by now all seemed pretty normal. Most of Sona's peerage were busy going through their contract numbers along with school projects that needed authorization. Each of the members were sitting on other pieces of furniture, all but one. Ruruko, who looked to be in great relief as she was smiling with her eyes held shut, was sitting on a large cube of ice. The sea tree devil had her skirt held up in her hands as she sat, presumably comfortably, on the large and square-shaped chunk of ice. Deciding not to ask questions, Issei continued to finish his book report on Atlantic squid mating behavior as instructed by Sona. Speaking of the devil, Sona was sitting at her large desk while going through paperwork of her own. Occasionally she would glance at Issei as she made it a point to place him on the couch closest to her desk. Issei found it odd that Momo and Rea were going to sit next to him on the large couch, only. For the two girls to quickly change their minds once they received piercing glances from both Subaki and Sona. After some time went by, Issei finished his book report and checked it over for mistakes while occasionally letting his eyes wander around the room and at different members. Meanwhile, Issei was able to notice Saji, who was glancing over and over again, toward Ruruko, more so, toward her behind he looked to be drooling a bit while fantasizing but was caught off guard the moment he felt a jab toward his stomach. Momo, who was sitting next to Saji, had a frustrated look on her face as she made a scoffing sound the moment Saji looked back at her. Issei found this rather funny but kept his laughter held back. Issei then looked back down at his finished report. Hoping that Sona might let him off of his leash for a bit, the team stood up and handed Sona his homework. This boring report about stupid squids is finished, President. So I was thinking that maybe I could. Sona cuts Issei off as she goes through his report with absolute scrutiny. You call this, finished, Hyodo. As student council president, I can't allow this half-assed attempt of a report to simply remain as it is. Hyodo, you are in need of a serious attitude adjustment. I suspect it's those two delinquents, Motohama and Matsuda, they are a bad crowd, Hyodo. I suggest getting your priorities straight if you plan on having a good future. Especially if you are going to be my, oh, uh, erm, ah, Sona caught herself at the very end. Her eyes went completely wide and all she could do was turn to Tsubaki. Tsubaki then clears her throat to gain everyone's attention from a stuttering Sona. Hyodo, sit back down and redo your report to the president's standards. Issei then stands at attention while retrieving his homework from a flustered and blushing Sona. Yes, ma'am. Issei then marches back to the couch while getting back to work. Sona then nods at Tsubaki for the save. The queen responds with a nod of her own. Meanwhile, the rest of the peerage went back to their respective tasks. As another half-hour dragged on, 
Issei struggled to keep his eyes open while trying to remember the different tentacle lengths of Atlantic squids. Stupid squids, this is stupid. Dedrag, do you know anything about these dumb animals? Issei could only hear snoring sounds in response. This made him even more tired. Slowly, Issei stopped moving his pencil and began to nod off into unconsciousness. Sona was going over some of the final bits of paperwork as Tsubaki was looking over it one last time. Then, from the rather silent room, Issei began to make noises. To both Sona and Tsubaki's surprise, these sounds were familiar. As this continued on, the sounds gathered the attention of the rest of the peerage. Tsubaki looked at Sona and they both shrugged. Issei then rolled over on the couch while using his arm as a pillow. The mumbling now became clear words as Issei's sleeping lips spoke. Yuma, um, Rainer, PFF MMMGH. Why does dying MMMGGHHAA hurt so fucking much? Rainer, you bitch, ah, don't touch me. Jaws all started to drop onto the floor one by one. All Sona could think to herself was, how did nobody ask him about this? It's so obvious. Then, the sea tree heiress took a quick glance at the members of her peerage and how they were reacting. As she assumed, they all looked to have different intensities of bewilderment written along each of their faces. They are going to have questions. She will eventually have to answer them. Sona does not keep things from her peerage. Her peerage or her family. This is how it's always been and will continue to be. Saji then raised his hand into the air as if wanting to ask a question. Sona nods toward her pawn while using her index finger. Against her lips to emphasize that he uses a quiet tone. Saji then stands up while whispering. President, who is Rainer? The rest of the peerage nod in response as they would like to know the answer to Saji's question. Sona took a moment to think about what to say. She thought that Issei should be the one to tell them if he chose to. Knowing it was bad enough that she already knew about Issei's personal trauma through means that didn't involve Issei telling her himself, Sona felt she just had no right to say anything. To Sona's surprise, Tsubaki spoke up. Rainer is a fallen angel who is now dead. She is of no concern. Just let it be for now, Saji. That goes for the rest of you as well. Issei then stirred a bit as the room went completely silent again. Sona then relaxed in her chair while now understanding that Tsubaki must have been awake during her conversation with the Red Dragon last night. Sona then wondered how her and Issei got into their, in Sona's opinion, erotic, situation earlier this morning. Of course, Sona did know how the entire situation played out, as she was the one who orchestrated it but didn't want to admit it, even to herself. Then the sea tree heiress caught herself drifting deeper into her thoughts. I wonder if he thinks my breasts are good enough. Should I have exposed both of them instead of just one? Wait. Shit. No. Sona now stands suddenly as her legs smacked onto the bottom ledge of the desk which made a loud noise. This woke Issei instantly as he then stood to his feet and at attention. Half asleep, Issei then made some kind of military salute with his tired hands as one of his eyes was still shut. Srasident Pona, I swear, I wasn't awake. Wait. I wasn't asleep. I mean, I mean. Issei's strange actions made a few of the peerage members begin to laugh at the awkward situation which included Saji and Momo. Sona was blushing intensely while looking very embarrassed. Tsubaki was tilting her head at her strange kahai while raising a perplexing eyebrow. Seen front of Kuo Academy, near the entrance. Rias was being followed by a grumpy-looking Akino, an indifferent Kaneko, a nervous Asia and the usual Kiba, who was acting like, well, Kiba. Rias had her eyes in all directions as she was clearly searching for something or rather, someone. To her disappointment, she was unable to find her pawn. This upset her a bit more as she was an older student which meant they didn't have any classes together. Her next shot would be the lunch bell. Usually, Issei just comes to the orc for lunch with the rest of the peerage, but for some reason, Rias thought he might not show up this time. Therefore, Lunch was going to have to double up as a non-stray devil hunt today. Rias nodded to herself and began to smile exhaustively. I am going to make things right. I am going to make things right. I am going to make things right. The usual routine of classes came and went. Luckily for Issei, most of Sona's peerage happened to be in his classes with him. Interestingly enough, those said peerage members now all seemed to take more interest in wanting to get to know Issei 
or offer to be his study partner or solve class questions together as a group. This was something the team wasn't really used to. As far as Motohama and Matsuda were concerned, it seemed like they were keeping their distance as Issei was now associating with the enemy. Aika Kuryu was also keeping to herself as she closely watched the situation from a distance. As the insanely perverted high school girl pondered to herself, she was coming up with random scenarios as to why Issei Hyodo was now spending time with the student council. Maybe him and Saji are sex slaves for the council. Oh, or maybe the council are Saji and Issei's sex slaves. Oh, or maybe, Saji and, aside from the obvious strangeness that was today, Issei also found himself sneezing quite a few times throughout the day. To make an odd situation odder, Saji also seemed to be struggling with a bout of hay fever as well. Issei couldn't help but wonder if it had something to do with Aika, as she continued to stare at him and Saji as her glasses would begin to fog up. Issei heard she had the power to see a man's, true size, with some kind of supernatural ability. With that, and considering the stares he was getting from her, he wouldn't put sneeze attacks as being another ability of hers. Scene, lunch hour. As Issei was heading out toward the cafeteria to get some melon bread, he found himself alone for the first time today. Figuring that Rias and the others would be back in the orc while having their lunches, something yummy that Akino probably made, Issei knew more or less that he should be free of any encounters by the lot of them. Taking a deep breath, Issei chose the school roof as a quiet place to have a quiet lunch to himself. Going to the ORC was only asking for pain in the teen's opinion, not to mention, inviting himself to hang out with Sona's group was simply out of the question. He has already inconvenienced the Seatree house enough to last a lifetime so the answer was a solid no. Well then, the roof it is. Unknown to Issei, Rias was scouting the entire campus along with her peerage. She would go as far as to ask individual students as to her pawn's whereabouts. She even went so far as to ask Matsuda and Motohama, both of whom simply shrugged while not knowing. Meanwhile Issei was walking up the rooftop staircase with his melon bread in hand. After opening the weather door, Issei was instantly dumbstruck. Sitting on all of the outside benches were all of the members of the student council. On the farthest bench was both Sona and Tsubaki. There was a single spot left in between the two girls as Tsubaki was silently pointing at it. Sona was looking at her bento box while not giving Issei any eye contact as she couldn't contain her blush. She couldn't help herself, but the moment Issei walked through the door and onto the roof, he looked a bit depressed at first. But he instantly smiled the moment he saw her. She was sure of it. Sona was the first person Issei noticed and he smiled. It was. That. Smile. A smile that Sona decided was meant for her and only for her. Still looking at her bento box, Sona spoke up. Sit down, Hyodo. She then pulled out another bento box while turning her head toward Issei's melon bread. And that is junk food. No wonder you fall asleep when doing something as simple as a book report. Issei then hides the melon bread behind his back and sits down while smiling nervously. Sona then hands the bento over. Silently, the group eat their lunches. Unknown to the group, they were being watched. Floating above the peerage in Issei, was a fat-looking bat. At closer glance, this was no ordinary bat, it was indeed Rias Grimori's familiar. Seen, ORC. I knew it, that slut. So that's why Seraphal was with Issei last night, it was all for her sister, Sona. All so she could get my Issei into her clutches. Oh, hell no, this will not fly. Rias was now pacing the occult research room while twirling her long and red hair in a nervous action. Meanwhile, the rest of her peerage were all standing around nervously. Akino no longer had an angry demeanor toward her, rather she looked more concerned if anything. Asia was hoping that Issei wasn't going to leave them for Sona Sitri. Kaneko was now worried just a bit, but only because she knew Issei's absence would cause her new friend, Asia, to be sad, at least, that's what she kept telling herself. Kiba on the other hand, just wanted Rias and Issei too kiss and make up so they could go back to hunting stray devils, but now that could be a problem. Chapter 8, Sona's Chance, a high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 8, I'll be here. Scene, Kuo Academy. After the lunch hour, the rest of the day went pretty normal for Issei, aside from his interactions with the student council throughout each class. It was finally the lesson of the day, Issei's, 
favorite, history class. Once the boring hour was over with, the instructor had the students hand in their reports. Issei was hoping that all of his forced and tortuous work would pay out in a good grade. Once he was on his way out of the class, the team, who was in deep thought was intercepted by Kiba. Issei stopped and smiled nervously. Kiba returned the smile while placing an arm over Issei's shoulder. Issei, would you please come with me back to the orc? Issei was about to simply say, yes, that was until Saji, Momo and Ruruko came up from behind him. Kiba noticed this while giving his attention to the sea tree peerage. Saji then smirked while speaking in a sarcastic yet mildly threatening voice. Say, Hyodo, you doing all right, man. Momo then jumped into the conversation with a smirk of her own. Is this guy bothering you, Hyodo? Ruruko was also going to say something, however she realized that the pain from Sona's punishment was beginning to flare up once again. With that, she needed another ice block to sit on. So instead of speaking, she simply placed both of her hands toward her butt and massaged her behind as discreetly as possible. Ignoring this, Kiba then replies as his smile has turned into a threatening grin of his own. Just remember, sea trees, there's not one of you who specializes in direct attacks. From what I understand, you are all just defense. Well, what do you think it is that I specialize in, hm? Issei knew Kiba had a bit of a pride streak and didn't want this situation to escalate either, so Issei placed his arms in front of Kiba and Saji. Stop it, you two. First off, too many people are watching right now. Now, I don't know how to wipe people's memories, but I can imagine, it's probably boring to do, like stupid squid reports. Issei got a few strange looks from all involved, however he ignored it and continued on. Anyway, Saji, Momo and I guess, Ruruko, it's fine. I need to have a talk with my president anyway. But, thank you guys for hanging out with me today. I know it sounds corny, but aside from the boring stuff like studying and doing homework, it was fun. At that, Momo then pulls Saji along as Ruruko runs behind them with her hands on her behind. As the three get out of earshot, Momo speaks up. We need to tell president about this ASAP. The other two nod in all seriousness. Scene, front doors of the old school building. Kiba and Issei were walking silently through the doors but then Kiba broke the silence with a frown on his face. Listen, man, I am really sorry about the president's reaction to your, well, confession. Issei stopped walking which caused Kiba to turn around. Issei then spoke while looking at the ground. Don't worry about it. Aside from making a complete fool of myself, I don't think it's going to cause too much lasting damage. Kiba was about to protest, but Issei then walked on and ahead of him. With that, the knight decided it was best to just leave it at that. As the main doors to the orc opened, Issei was not surprised to see the rest of his peerage. They were all standing next to Rias's desk. Speaking of Rias, she was sitting in her large chair with a blank look. That look changed the moment Rias's eyes met Issei's. As the Switch Princess's face began to contort into fifty shades of pure rage, Issei couldn't help but feel a bit of anger. Himself. Rias then spoke in a direct tone. Issei, mind on telling me where you've been since last night. Looking at her entitled and angry eyes, Issei wanted to snap back, but thought he should just be truthful. After all, regardless of the outcome of today, at least nobody could say that, Issei was a lying piece of shit. Plus, if he left out some of the more risky parts of his evening, it could help to smooth things over. Issei then took a deep breath as he approached the large desk with Kiba walking behind him. President Ramori, I apologize for storming out of the club room last night. As it stands, President Sona Sitri and her sister, Milky, Erm Seraphal Leviathan Sama, well, they must have thought I was in trouble or something. But for some reason, Seraphal Sama teleported me to President Sona's dorm. There, they insisted I stay the evening. Rhea stood from her desk while stomping her foot down, hard, onto the floor. Really now, and you're telling me you just, oh, I don't know, slept. Actually, yeah, speaking of sleeping. Well, let's just say I know Sona's little apartment pretty well. I also know about the only two beds in that tiny place. So, Issei, what parts are you leaving out of your story? Hmm. Issei wasn't going to dare speak about where he actually was sleeping, rather, who he was sleeping with. 
and he most certainly was not going to talk about Sona's exposed breast. The problem with Issei at this point in time was that he was thinking about his strange evening and early morning. These thoughts of beautiful Sona, staring at him, first thing in the morning, Issei couldn't help but begin to blush. Rias, who was ruthlessly scrutinizing Issei's body language for anything suspicious picked up on his blushing. Pointing at Issei accusingly, Rias began to yell, I fucking knew it, you are fucking my best friend, aren't you? Issei starts shaking his head rapidly indicating that Rias was completely wrong. No, no, that's not true. Rias continues her reaming of Issei. What's this, it's not true. Oh, really now, oh, wait, let me guess, you are also fucking Seraphal too, am I right? Instantly the rest of the peerage can't believe what they are hearing. Akino was about to say something to defend a worried looking Issei, that was until Rias continued on with her rant. Hyodo Issei, of all the things that I cannot stand, it's a lying pervert who fucks my slut friends. Issei, I am going to fucking trade your ass. That's right, I've had it. Out of sight, out of mind. Instantly, the orc fell into complete silence. As Rias was heaving in and out with sheer rage, Issei simply stood where he was while looking directly at her. His face showed zero emotion as his eyes looked to have lost all of their natural warm color. Kiba almost fell down and onto the floor in shock while Kaneko and Asia had their jaws agape. Akino was grinding her teeth and looked as if she was about to tear Rias apart. Everyone then jumps a bit as Issei replies in a very cold and non-Issei kind of way. Well then, so, that's that. Rias's posture changes into a now very worried one as Issei doesn't look like his normal self, he looks far away, even though he is standing right in front of the heiress. Issei continues. I suppose you can just contact me when you're ready to, trade my ass. Now really freaking out now as she didn't mean what she said, not even a little bit, Rias panics suddenly. Issei, wait, I didn't mean. Issei cuts Rias off with a louder and even colder voice. Don't, no more, no more games, Rias. I'm fucking done, too. Rushing past Kiba, Issei threw the orc doors open and proceeded to dash out without a second glance. Issei's dramatic exit was cut short when the teen almost collided with Sirzex and Graphia. Issei, stopped in place while looking at both devils. They both had very worried looks but all Issei could see was the pretentious and high-class devils who thought of him as nothing more than a sacrificial pawn. This angered him as they blocked his path. To Graphia and Sirzex's great surprise, Issei placed a hand on each of their shoulders while pulling them apart from one another. Once this happened, the teen removed his hands while proceeding to rush in between them and out of the orc altogether. Without hesitation, Sirzex knew something was seriously wrong and spoke to Graphia. Go after him, don't leave him alone. As Graphia nodded, both devils were cut off by a very familiar voice. Sirzex Kuhn, Graphia Chan, hello. Oh, don't worry Graphia Chan, Issei will be just fine. My Sona Chan and Peerage will keep an eye on him. Graphia looks toward Sirzex who nods. Seraphal then approaches the two. I suggest you two have a nice long talk with Rias. While you do that, I'll make sure that Issei doesn't do anything stupid along with Sochan. Sirzex now looks incredibly cross. Rias will be dealt with, I can assure you of that fact, Seraphal. The Mao was absolutely furious. Never has he seen the boy who calls him, Onisama, look the way he did just now. Also, Hearing what his sister had told him, that was enough to make Sirzex want to blow up a large section of the underworld. Scene, Rooftop. Opening the weather doors once again, Issei found this roof empty. He wasn't sure why he came here again but he knew he didn't want to be alone this time. So, why did he come here? All he could feel was nothing and this feeling of nothing was more painful than light spears tearing through in his gut. This reminded him a bit of rain air which made him feel sick. To compare a psychotic killer of a fallen angel to his master made Issei feel absolutely nauseous. Issei then slumped onto the same stone bench that he sat on earlier that day, during the lunch hour. Looking at his right arm, Issei was going to speak with Dedrag, but instead he just broke down. After a few minutes of intense sobbing, Issei stood from his position and began to stare at the setting sun. He then shouted at the top of his voice for the whole world to hear in his pained state. Fuck you, you hear me, Rias. I said fuck you, go ahead, 
Trade me for all I care. You don't deserve anyone to actually love you. If I knew what I fucking know now, before I fought the flaming chicken, Rias, I would have gladly let him force you into marriage. This whole time, you played with me. You were no different than that cunt, Rainer. I hope you rot in hell. Issei immediately jumped the moment he heard a response. Kyoto, watch your language. I don't care if school hours are over with, you will keep a clean mouth on this campus, do you get me, mister? Standing at the rooftop entrance was none other than Sona Citri. Turning around, Issei just stood in place with a blank stare. The blank stare changed into widened eyes the moment he felt two warm arms wrapped around him. Now, completely shocked, Issei finds himself being hugged by the student council president. Not just that, but Sona seemed to have her face planted in Issei's chest. She was holding on for dear life. Issei could compare this grip with that of her older sisters. Why was she doing this? Was it because she overheard Rias just now? At this point, does it matter? Issei didn't want to be alone, lo and behold, he wasn't. Then, the broken-hearted teen couldn't hold it in anymore and began to cry out loud. Sona simply tightened her hug and let him. Well that's all for now see you in the next part.